Good afternoon, and welcome to Masterminds Lessons in Leadership. I'm joined by my co-host, Peter Linneman, who will discuss with me today and every time we do this, the intersection of leadership and strategy, which is at the vortex of what we feel makes great companies great. And we're delighted to be joined today by Sandy Mathrani, who is the CEO of WeWork and has a very distinguished career in real estate prior to WeWork. I actually uh, was able to recruit him to become the CEO of GGP. Uh, he took GGP out of bankruptcy, uh, ultimately took it public, and then took it private again in a partnership with Brookfield. Uh, by way of background, Sandeep emigrated from India when he was 16 years old, earned two degrees in engineering from the Stevens Institute of Technology, and I'm going to let him tell you about the first real estate deal he ever did. Hi, Bill. Hi, Peter. Thanks for having me. Uh, I feel humbled every time I get onto the phone with guys like you and talking about leadership. So, uh, uh, but, it, but it is true. But I have to tell you a story. See, Peter, I can turn the question in a question, too. So do you know when Bill called me to recruit me for GGP, I read my name in the Wall Street Journal before he called me, just FYI. So, <laughs> so I think he was forced to call me and said, hey, by the way, your name's in the That's Wall true. Street Journal, okay? <laughs> I'll I, have you know, to try that, Sandeep. That's a neat trick. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's a fact. <laughs> anyway, um, um, so, so but, but I will say that in 1986, when I sort of graduated with my second master's, um, I, I obviously was an engineer. I went to work for a construction management company in Washington, D.C., doing major infrastructure projects for them. Uh, I, you know, you graduate, you buy a new car, so I bought this uh, Nissan Sentra for $3,500. Um, I was driving around looking at apartments, uh, and uh, it was in Duke Street in Alexandria, Virginia, 4600 Duke Street. And I saw this apartment, it was 55000 bucks. In those days, you can get an FHA loan, 95% financing. So you needed about 3000 bucks with closing costs. I looked at the car, I looked at the apartment, looked at the car, looked at the apartment, sold the car. Um, I bought a, uh, you, you guys are, and as you joked about being old enough, you, you guys will get this. I bought a 1976 Volkswagen Rabbit diesel, orange in color, where when you put on the heater, gas came out in your nostrils, okay? So, uh, uh, so, so anyway, uh, and, and, and I bought that car for 600 bucks and I had $2,900 borrowed money at I think 18% of my Visa credit card, about 300 bucks, and I bought this apartment. And uh, 18 months later, I sold it for about 75,000 bucks. I made 20 grand. You know, for a guy with two master's degrees making $25,000, $20,000 was a lot of money. And I said, this real estate stuff's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I bought a house, sold a house, made 10 grand. And I said, I like this shit. I got to go find a job in real estate. And that was sort of the, <laughs> there you are. the irony there you of are. Uh, how there I got into are. the business. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. Um, I think you win the award for quote, the reward of living in interesting times, in that you come into your current position in an interesting time, and a lot of things happening, and pretty much just as you get the seat warm, COVID happens. You talk about hectic times. How, how did you keep a focus? How did you um, Keep a strategy? How do you keep things moving forward? Critics doubt if anybody ever comes back to the office? Give us some insight. So, you know, um, let me say this in a good way. You know, when I took the job at GGP, I'll go back. I find a lot of parallels, by the way, between the two, uh, as I've now lived through this for 13 months. And I took the job at GGP. I'll actually never forget, you know, Steve Roth telling me, uh, man, you're going into a business that's going to go to zero. And, you know, I'm not sure who was right or wrong, but, and, and I sort of sat back and said, but I'm going to be CEO of this company and I get a chance. You know, how, do, how can I not take this job? And I took it, right? So, but I obviously believed that the best retail real estate would survive. And I really believed that quality wins at the end of the day. And I sort of stayed very focused, you know, as much as the noise around me talked about, you know, the death of the mall and the death of retail, e-commerce killing you, but you sort of stayed focused on the price. So when I sort of came here, 
um, they, they, there were four reasons. Like one was WeWork is a verb, it's, uh, it's synonymous with flex space, uh, had a very good balance sheet, uh, you know, at $4 billion of liquidity. And the problem with the business was the expense structure was upside down, right? So it was bloated SGNA, mismanagement of operating expenses, you know, some of the real estate was not, you know, uh, good quality or would never be profitable. So, you know, I knew that I could make this company profitable if we could get the SGNA expense structure right and we could right size the real estate portfolio. So when COVID hit, kind of interestingly enough, I actually put blinders on, right? I was on a mission. And then it put, I put my foot on the accelerator on cutting the expense side of the equation, right? And so since I had blinders on, I had a mission to basically right-size the organization from every aspect, um, you know, I, I, I just went to work. The fact that I needed to get out of a whole bunch of leases because they're never making any money, okay, just expedited me doing that and, and giving me a platform that could work. So I've got $1.8 you know, billion of cost out of the system, which means I've put the, the company on a path to profitability. It wasn't until September, October, <clears throat> when the revenue started to get hit finally, okay, did I have to sit back and say, okay, uh, do I have enough liquidity to make sure that I make it to the other side? And of course, we knew we always did, um, uh, you know, uh, but, but that was the first time I sort of sat, I said, now what, right? Because I, you know, none of us expected COVID to go on as long as it's gone on. Um, and, and so the, the, the thing I, I did a lot during that process was, you know, over communicate to the team, was very transparent with the team. I had a laser focus on the business where I was going to take it. Uh, and, and I said, if I can get the cost structure right, I know the revenue side would rebound. Uh, so, so I, you know, I, I was actually, I literally put blinders on and over communicated. Sort of like uh, an actor doesn't read the reviews of the show, they just do the show. Yeah. Well said. Bill? Uh, Cindy, I've recruited a few people for you over the course of our, uh, of our relationship. And what's always struck me is I think you've been a very strong believer in culture relative to driving business success. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you uh, frame a culture as you're going into a company and uh, preparing to turn it around. So, you know, when you go back to 2010, again, in 2011, you know, culture wasn't a buzzword then. Like, it didn't even exist, to be honest with you. People now talk about it a lot, but it really wasn't talked about much in 2011. And I think there was a reason for that, at least in the real estate business, because a lot of the real estate companies, you know, still had their founders as part of the business. Mm -hmm. And essentially the founders, okay, DNA is the DNA of the company. Right. So, you know, they didn't have to do anything else. And so when I took over GGP, what I realized was effectively, what is the DNA of the company? And it occurred to me as I was streamlining the company, you know, there was a sense of entitlement in the company. There was no humility. Right. So I started using words such as that. And I said, but that really means those are values. I right? said, so the value system is wrong. And then in, in, in talking to, to, to Les Wexner, actually, he said, oh, what you really need, mean is, Sandeep, that the culture is all wrong. And I said, you're right. So I said, what do I do about that? He said, no, 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 I'm going to give you a book. And he gave me a book called Winning Cultures, Winning Teams by this guy called Larry Sen. And it basically talks about how, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast and what you need to do. So I hired this guy, Larry Sen. And I said, Larry, can you help me come up with the core values of the company and build a culture? So I knew there was something there that I needed to do, that there needed to be a DNA of the family, okay, that would unite us, that was beyond just numbers, right? Everyone talks about earnings per share or revenue or profit or leave their loss, you know, but most people in the company don't connect to those things. It's only the very top echelon that connects to that. The, the person running the mall, uh, doesn't really connect to that at all, right? Doesn't understand what that even means, right? But they understand that, you know, hey, if you can do the right thing and that's a core value, oh, that's the kind of com company I want to be associated with. You know, hey, we, we believe that we're going to do this together, right? Okay, that we, we get that, you know? 
so what are the core values? And what we did was we came up with five core values at GGP, and then we talked about five core constituents. And then the mantra became, if you can live by one core value and serve one core constituent a day, you know, and you do that five days a week, we will eventually make money. And what landed up happening was, okay, they were subliminally always thinking about profit, but on the outside always talking about culture. It was a fascinating concept. It was a little bit of an experiment for me, okay, even though I knew it was the right thing. And then I sort of, you know, made it my, made it my thing for 10 years, you know. Uh, and I, and I you know, said if I want to be remembered for something at GGP was to have built a wonderful culture, right? Knowing all full well the probability of it succeeding beyond my departure would be small, right, because everyone wants to change it. So the first thing I did when I came here, now I didn't have to worry about a year, I knew it worked, okay? So I embarked, I called the same guy, Larry Sen, and by the way, Peter, Larry Sen is, I think, now 87 years old. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's a wow. And he so there's still hope runs, for me, you know, I, got, I got a bit of runway yet. <laughs> so he still, so he's still, he still <laughs> runs marathons and triathlons, and he's, you know, it's an incredibly fit human being. And anyway, so, so I called Larry, and I said, you know, would you help me again, you know? And actually, we have just gone through the process of finishing our core values that are applicable to WeWork. And we're going through what is called the unfreezing process, which really means that how do you get rid of the bad habits and put in the good habits, okay? Um, and it's a whole process. And it'll take a whole year before all of us talk about you know, our core values and our core constituents. And when you start talking about core values, the whole conversation changes with most of the company, because that's what they're really interested in, right? Do I want to, do, this, is, this is a cultural fit for me or not. It's like a, it's like a marriage, it's like a relationship, right? So, so, so to me, I, I actually learned you know, this by accident. I practiced it for 10 years. It turned out to be the right path to go on. Uh, so well, so I'm, a, I'm a believer. The points you make about the founders, and many of them had been founders long, long there. I had never thought of. That's a very interesting and a big transition for the industry as it has evolved. So you've now developed strategies at GGP and then and now at WeWorks for the other side or you're you're in the process of for the other side. Um, how, how do you think about that given all the uncertainty still out there? How do you formulate it? get buy-in for it as you pursue strategy. And I throw in, is it different whether you're public or private, what you can do strategically? Um, I've actually not been a, I'll ask the, the second question first and then I'll go to the first question. I've actually been a believer that you do the right thing for the business and don't worry about the markets. So whether you're public or private, you shouldn't worry about it because long term, if you have conviction and you're right, it's gonna pan out correctly, right? Uh, and so, so I, I actually think, uh, you know, people sit back and say it's easier to change a business in the public light. That's only because you're looking at a stock price. Right? When the stock price is going down, you're never accessing the public market, so it's sort of irrelevant, right? Uh, and, and if you're private, okay, if you need access to capital and you need that to turn the business around, you don't have it. So there's no perfect formula, right? So I don't think it really matters whether you're public or private. I think you just got to have the right strategy and be able to pivot, and the investment community will eventually get it uh, and, and be your supporter uh, if, you, if your strategy is the right strategy. Uh, uh, so if you're, if you're a public company, the strategy is wrong, you go, you go out of business. If you're a private company, the strategy is wrong, you go out of business. So the end result is the same, right? <laughs> um, so, so, uh, you know, so, so fundamentally, so how do you get conviction, right? I think the one thing I've always learned, and that has to do with my career, is there's a word called pivot that most people don't really appreciate the value of it. Okay, you have to look at the tea leaves, and the, you know, and the tea leaves generally tell you the path to go. Uh, there are enough warnings on what the right path is or what the wrong path is as you take steps. Um, and you just gotta be careful to listen to them. And, and, and therefore, you know, when you have a strategy, even though it's a very long-term strategy, because you need to have a strategy of three to five years in our business, you can't do it over 12 months just because everything takes three to five years. 
but you have to be able to sit back and say, hey, you know, uh, the, the things are moving in a different direction, uh, and, and can I pivot, and not be afraid to pivot. Most people, what they do is they pick a strategy, and their ego comes in the way. And the ego, okay, makes you fulfill that strategy because you can accept to say, I was wrong. And I think that's one of the biggest flaws of, to, of leaders. Hmm. Right? And so you have to learn how to pivot. And, and, and if you can't pivot uh, and say, you know what, I made a mistake, I'm going to write this off, but I'm not going to go spend more money after this, but I'm going to pivot. And I'm going to go tell the world I made a mistake. I'm going to tell the world I lost $500 million, okay? But I know that I can correct myself. I think you'd be more respected and you have a better chance of winning long term. Well, you're, you're showing that humility, right? You're showing that sensitivity to the fact that, you know, it's okay for a leader to admit they're wrong and then correct it. It's, it's an important quality, you're right. Um, Sandeep, other than pivoting, what's another great leadership lesson that you've learned turning around these businesses? Uh, I'll tell you one I fail at. Uh, okay. You know, I think it's just as important because yeah, I, you know, you know, um, you know, uh, like I, I walk around with a card and I read it every day. It says, a, you know, a leader's quality is to provide two sorts of resources, human and capital, and to provide a, provide a direction, right? And 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 that should not be misconstrued by saying that you need to listen, learn, and advise. I'm really bad at listening, learning, and advising. Okay, and I really work hard every day to do that. Okay, uh, and 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 I, I would sort of sit back and say that we all get the first part, the resources and the strategy. We really don't get the second part because we are a lot of leaders are really bad listeners. Okay, they think they're really good listeners, but they're really bad listeners. Okay, and 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 I really have to train myself uh, to listen learn from them and advise because what you really want is really smarter people around you in the room to be advising you uh, and what they're really looking for you is you know reaffirmation that their thought process is correct versus the other way around most leaders okay want people around them to agree okay uh, yeah. and 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 that's the big difference yeah i once said that i Jokingly, I once said that we define somebody who's smart by they agree with us, and we define somebody as dumb when they disagree with us. And there's a human nature part of it, right? That, Absolutely. Uh, that, that, that goes that way. Um, that's a good lead in. I, I don't know if your parents are still alive, but if we had them on the phone right now and we said, what, what are you most proud of? Uh, in terms of Sandy, but what do you think they'd say? Well, uh, you know, unfortunately, both my parents have passed away, uh, you know, over 10 years ago, but I, I think it would be interesting. I think my father would say, uh, wow, firstly, he finished two master's degree. I don't think the guy would ever go to college. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think the second thing he would sit back and say that I never thought he could ever lead. Uh, you know, I was a very playful child. I was not academically motivated all the way through high school. I only got ac academically, you know, focused in 10th grade. So, uh, you know, so I, and I think while, I, while he was alive and I was working and climbing the ladder, he was always amazed at the fact that, you know, I would continue to, to, to rise the, the, the ladder. I think my father would be shocked on two fronts. One is that I'm, you know, even halfway considered to be an intellectual. Okay. That's true. No, you are. Okay. You are. Uh, or, or someone who's respected in an industry. Uh, and, and then I think the second part that actually I could, I would be able to lead a, a, an organization. I think both things would surprise them. Mm -hmm. What you would you want to talk about the intellectual? The bill. I had a, I have a cousin who's ten years older than me. Let's go way back. When and he was signed to play for the Cincinnati Reds way back. They called him the professor because he had a library card. So in the real estate business, it doesn't take a lot to be an intellectual, Sandy. But... Um, Sandy, let me ask you uh, another question. Who uh, was your greatest mentor and what did you learn? I, actually, I've had uh, three great men, four great mentors. I mean, actually, every leader of my company has been a great mentor. So the first guy I worked for was a small shopping center developer called Sanford Nallet, a guy called Sandy Nallet. 
And then he taught me the business. He taught me how to do back of the envelope math. Okay, I, and I, to date, you know, 30 odd years later, just pride myself in doing back of the envelope math. Okay, and I can, he taught me how what was directionally right, okay, but not absolutely wrong. Right, so there was a, there's a fundamental you know, you know, difference, and so so I, I thought he taught me the business. Uh, Bruce Ratner, you know, and I'll, I'll tell you, so, you know, I, I've actually said this publicly. So, literally told me I would never be a leader, uh, and, uh, uh, and and he actually did something that was that woke me up. Okay, he said if you want to be a leader, you need to go get some outside help. Okay. Uh, and it was very fascinating, and I could have argued with him and said, you're asking me to go to a therapist, okay, and I find that offensive. And I didn't. I found some guy who was, like, he called himself, I don't know, a cultural leader or something, but he was a therapist for all practical purposes, <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and I went to this guy for a while, and, you know, he, you know, I guess, you know, I don't know whether he made me a better person or not, I'm not really sure, but I took that as a positive light. And, and Bruce gave me a lot of leeway, except he didn't think I could ever be a leader. He gave me every leeway to run the business, right? So, uh, and, and he was my biggest patron. And today he and I are incredibly close friends and, uh, and we talk every day and, you know, and, and we have huge mutual respect for each other. And, you know, Steve Roth was, you know, again, I, I really work for amazing people, you know, and, you know, and, and, and Steve basically, you know, the, the, he had an amazing quality. No matter, how, he made you be very well prepared for every meeting, which today's youngsters are just not prepared. Okay, because the goddamn Google, they think the first thing on Google is the right answer, so they're not doing much research. Like we did a lot of research, a lot of you know, preparation, um, and, and so. And, and he would always come up with the one question that even after hours and hours of doing a Q and A with my team, that what questions and answers could he ask? that he would, he would find. And I thought that was very interesting because it made you want to think through all things. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, as much as Sam Zell, obviously I never worked for Sam Zell, but Sam and Steve were very good friends. And, 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 and the one thing that, that Steve always said that Sam would say is that always look at a deal and see if you lose money on that deal, can you survive it? Don't tell me how much money you can make on the deal. That we get. Everyone can do, do that analysis paralysis. So, um, so it was very interesting. So it was, it was, it was coming, you know, with, with real, real leaders. And, and of course, I mean, I, and, and Bruce Flatt, I mean, I, I, you know, I think uh, I, I'm still amazed at his, at his ability to, to think in, in scale. And what Bruce taught me, and it's kind of very interesting, he was always encouraging, and he would always sit back and say, Everything's going to be okay. Don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. The world's going to get better. No matter how bad the world was getting, it was going to get better. Okay? And the man is an, a one and obviously an amazing thinker, amazing vision. Uh, and to you know, have a chairman of a company for 10 years with that kind of access uh, to a person uh, and, 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 and the ability to, to be a motivator. Um, so I, I've been very fortunate. I've had uh, great that's leaders. Like, that's a great group of... Uh... Great group of people. Bill, you know, if I could get you to move your head, um, I know he has this behind him and it's, it has about generosity. Would you talk for a moment about how philanthropy fits into your thinking um, personally or corporate uh, as you might? Um, so, I, you know, I, I, it actually stems back from when I was at university. Uh, I. Uh, <clears throat> um, made my money through, you know, I had a scholarship for my tuition, but for my boarding and food, I, I made my money by tutoring. I was tutoring math, uh, you know, from sophomore year to my senior year. And so it all started off uh, by me first giving money to my alma mater because I was grateful for what they did uh, for me and prepared me. And I created a tutoring program uh, for them and I sponsored it. And, and I got a lot of joy in that, in the sense that the uh, in, you know in an engineering school uh, you know the, the success of people going from freshman year to, to sophomore year is used to be like seventy percent and now it's over ninety percent it was purely a function of tutoring so I felt albeit it's philanthropy is giving back because someone gave to you but I'm a big believer of doing something okay 
to advance the next generation, right? So it's more about education. So I really stuck to that general theme. You know, my philanthropy, you know, goes towards scholarships to children, goes towards creating education programs, internship programs. Uh, and I just feel that I was fortunate enough to have been educated, been fed by having that sort of internship program, by having that tutoring program. So it's just me giving back to the next generation of exactly how I got to where I got to. So I'll have to have you Zoom one time with my uh, Kenya orphans. We have 140 and have you uh, talk to them about some of these topics, uh, the college kids. That'd be great. Yeah, it would it'd be awesome. And Sandeep, is kind of a, a wrap-up question, speaking of the uh, next generation of leadership. If you were in front of a, um, you know, a hall of, of uh, the next generation of leaders, uh, what one piece of advice would you give them? So here's my, here's my, here's my parallel. When you're young, when you're four years old, uh, you can ski straight down the mountain. No turns. Right? <laughs> Low center of gravity, you just go. Just go. The older you get, you do S-turns. You get to the same point from beginning to end, but in S-turns. And to me, life is about S-turns. You keep pivoting. Don't think you get from A to Z you know, in one way. So that's my parallel. So wow. I always believe in Esther. That's perfect. I, you know, I, I've never heard, Bill, that sort of quite twist on it. I, I love it. I'll probably steal it from you, Sandeep, and use it. Okay. In- you need a title for your next book, Peter. That's it. <laughs> S turns are, are the key. Turns. Yeah, yeah, I think I like yeah. that. Well, Sandeep, we will, we will let you go, but thank you so much. This has been great. And, uh, you know, you've had, you've had a great run. And there's more to come. So we do appreciate your, uh, sharing your perspective. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bill. I really appreciate you having me. You take care.